Are you frustrated, even angry with the answers you're receiving to your pressing biblical questions? Are you hungry for some straight-talking biblical truth? Welcome into Igniting a Nations, Revealing the Truth with Rabbi Eric Walker. We're not afraid to tackle these issues and find the answers. Call us now at 850-660-9595. Here's your host, Rabbi Eric Walker. Shalom, shalom. Welcome to this beautiful Friday morning, August the 19th at 8 o'clock a.m. into this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we talk about the headlines the Heartlines and Biblical Truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker. This is a live call-in show, and the phone lines are open at 850-660-9595. And we hope that you will call in and participate in today's program. Give me a call, and let's talk about what's on your heart, mind, or spirit. These two hours are just a small part of the 24-7 programming on our station where you can listen on the iHeartRadio app, the Igniting a Nation app, and the ignitinganation.com revised website. These two hours are simulcast on all social media, so you can watch and listen. The programs throughout the day are teachings and sermons given over the past 20 years. And if you're interested in the full series or a particular teaching, visit the Biblical Truth Library on our website, where you can acquire the entire teaching you can acquire all of them, you can acquire some of them, you can get them a la carte or a subscription service. We would not be able to bring you the rebirth of the highly successful TV program, Revealing the Truth, that ran for over 2,500 episodes if it were not for the generosity of you, our faithful donors, and we encourage you to continue to support us here as we try to reach the nations with the Word of God and serve this Northwest Florida market with the only 24 seven Christian talk radio station between Mobile and New Orleans. So there's a large area that don't get uh, Christian talk radio that are hungry for the truth. And you are a part of supporting that as well as our outreach in Kisi, Kenya, where we have the Igniting Nation Worship Center headed up by Pastor Job Ezekiel and Sister Callister. And they are growing tremendously and are looking to acquire two acres of land in order to put a banana plantation on the banana farm. So if you are interested in supporting that work or our work in Israel or our work here <clears throat> from the United Nation Broadcast Center, then please go to our website and click on donate and set up a recurring donation or a one-time donation. And if you want to designate it for Israel or designate it for Kenya, for Kisi, Kenya, then please put that on your contribution. But without you, we could not be able to do what we do, reaching thousands upon thousands of people every day. We also are deeply indebted and grateful to our faithful sponsors. <coughs> Sorry, <coughs> excuse me. The Don Burt team at Keller Williams Emerald Coast and Navarre Chiropractic Center. In both cases, I have personal experience, and Don Burton and her team helped me through every aspect of home acquisition imaginable over the past three years. Don and her team have been serving the needs of both military and civilian clients for many years and is loved by all. If you're even thinking about relocating to the beautiful Emerald Coast or considering a move of any kind in Northwest Florida, give Don and her team a call at 850-684-4284 and check them out online at www.teambert.com. And our great friends and my personal chiropractor at Navarre Chiropractic Center, uh, this incredible team led by Dr. Laird Likens, uh, this entire team took me from 24 hours a day of debilitating neck pain to a pain-free life. There are chiropractors and there's one everywhere, but then there's this team focused on a holistic approach that incorporates every technique from classical adjustment to acupuncture, heat therapy, traction, massage, and personal trainers to make sure you will get the best care possible. This full service practice should be your first stop after a car accident or any injury to your body. No insurance, no worries. They have a plan to accommodate any situation. 
Give them a call right now at 850-939-3339 and look them up online at NavarChiropracticCenter.com. If you go to the IgnitingNation.com website, you'll find that uh, we have a little program guide there for the live show. And in that program guide, we tell you what we're doing Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Friday is our Revealing Life. Uh, it's all under the covering of Revealing the Truth, but focusing on different aspects, whether or not yesterday, the book of Revelation, the day before, Revealing Prophecy, uh, the day before, uh, Revealing the Bible, and on Monday is Revealing the Truth. Uh, I may have that backwards. I'm not looking at it, but it gives you kind of an idea thematically. And if you want to follow along a particular teaching, this eight to 10 o'clock hour is the one to do that. And the other 24 hours a day or 22 hours a day during the week, 24 hours a day on the weekend, it is a, uh, what they call an auto DJ. It, uh, picks a random, uh, tracks to play. And they are not in sequence as they would be on the library. So if you want to get replays of each one of the shows, you can find those either on our webpage at ignitionation.com, which is always your first place to check where I'll be, what I'm doing, what's going on, but also on our YouTube channel under the live section. And so you'll be able to get copies of that and uh, review, uh, share them with your small group. We certainly are ones that are not opposed to you downloading and reusing, give the attribution. Uh, that's out of respect to the creators of this, but feel free. This information is not mine. This is from the word of God and that is available to all. Today, I wanna to talk to you about something that is uh, very pressing in the world and that is counterfeit. Not just the counterfeiter, but counterfeit teachings, counterfeit leaders, counterfeit gospel, counterfeit money. Uh, there are scams, there are deceptions, there are all kinds of things going on. And I'm gonna start out uh, with uh, kind of a, uh, short um, teaching, if you will, on the counterfeit, and then get into the spiritual gift of discernment, which is what's going to prepare you for being able to identify the counterfeit. But I'll be honest with you. I am astonished, aghast, appalled, undone, unnerved, distraught, and bewildered by the deception of the world that masks itself as truth, but is in opposition to God's word. Many, when I mean many, I am talking about many more than a million, many more than a hundred million. I'm talking about billions with a B are being deceived and buying into a counterfeit gospel that tickles the ears and makes us feel better about ourselves. But are we equipped to know the difference between the authentic and the counterfeit? They look and sound and often feel so much like the real that we are easily taken. How can we tell the difference? I want to share a story with you. A boy who wanted to learn about Jade went to study with a talented old teacher. The gentleman put a piece of this precious stone into his hand and told him to hold it tight. Then he began to talk of philosophy, men, women, the sun, and almost everything under it. After an hour, he took back the stone and sent the boy home. The procedure was repeated for several weeks. The boy became frustrated. When would he be told about the jade? Now, this young boy was too polite, however, to question the wisdom of his venerable teacher. Then one day, when the old man put a stone into his hands, the boy cried out instinctively, that's not Jade. He had come to know the feel of the authentic so that he could instinctively discern the counterfeit, having only felt the weight and the texture and the coolness of the authentic. 
he did not study the counterfeit, yet he recognized it immediately. There are many stories about how the FBI and the Treasury and banks train their agents and employees to identify the counterfeit bills. Some include counting endless piles of fives, tens, twenties, fifties, and hundreds until they know instinct instinctively the weight and feel of the authentic. Then, after hours, even days of this money handling, they insert a counterfeit into the mix and wait for it to be found simply through touch. Now, many of us have seen you take a $50 bill and you present it to uh, the cashier and they uh, take a little marker and they're looking for that, that uh, metal strip that's in there or they put it under a scanner. Uh, but they're not familiar with the touch. The people who need to be familiar with the touch, the bankers, the ones that handle lots of cash, need to be familiar with the feel of the authentic. And so it's simply through touch. They don't study the counterfeit to see the different nuances. There's just too many. And it's just like we don't study Satan. We don't study evil. We study the Bible, the word of God. We study good. And because of our knowledge of good, we should be able to recognize evil. As believers, we must also be on the lookout for the counterfeit amongst us. We do not study the counterfeit, but the authentic in order to recognize what is of God and what is of man. For what is of God is authentic. But what is of man can and often is counterfeit. Who counterfeits in the kingdom? Who would want to perpetrate such a lie that would confuse and deceive so many? Even though there are many pulpits today that deny a literal hell or an enemy bent on our destruction, God and his word tell a much different story. I want to stop before I get into the scriptures because I want to give Equal time, if you will. I read these feeds that come to me from academic, from prophetic, from Bible scholars, from Bible authors, from pastors, from denominations, and contain within them, <clears throat> and my interaction, if you will, Excuse me, I'm going to need to it's the nice part about having the wireless mic as opposed to the big old mic hanging out in front of me. I think that you can hear better and I can mute so you don't have to hear me clear my throat. But in this information contains very subtle hints as to the leanings of various denominations and their teachings. We were warned in scripture that there was going to be a time and it was going to be an end time sign of an increase in apostasy and the great falling away. Now, this is an end time sign that we are living in. Now, unfortunately, so many are biblically illiterate and are not operating in the gift of discernment that they are being subjected to a gospel that's not the gospel. And an exegesis or teaching on the word a teaching on the word that skews it as we talked about the other day, by having someone shed their own light as opposed to God's light on the word. Genesis 3, 1 to 16 tells a much different story. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the tree, trees in the garden. 
But God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree. And I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you among all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you'll strike his heel. If you want to know the full story behind it and the prophetic impact of these words being spoken almost 6,000 years ago and the impact they have today, get a copy of my book, 315, The Genesis of All Prophecy. In Revelation 12, 7 through 9, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. So there is an enemy and here is how he is described in John 10, 7 to 10. Therefore, Jesus said again, I tell you the truth. I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. This is not the denying that there is an enemy in the world. This is actually establishing quite clearly that the seed of the woman, Messiah, recognizes our adversary and we, his sheep, are not to listen to his lies. So what do we do? There's that handsome pastor with his doctorate in divinity or doctorate in ministry or doctorate in theology. And he's in a beautiful three-piece suit. And he is eloquent. And he is convincing. And he has personality and charm and he pulls the congregation in with stories that will be endearing and engaging and then he shares with them three or four passages from scripture and gives them his perspective on that and people walk away with a coin phrase uh, a message and you'll find it Many times you'll see it in stores. It takes on a new life. And it's not scripture. It's a saying that they got from the message that was their takeaway. It was 
the quote. Oftentimes I've asked people, so how was church yesterday? They say, oh, it was great. The message was incredible. The worship off the charts. I say to them, tell me, tell me, what was the message? Well, I don't exactly remember what the message was, but man, it was on point. It was great. That may have been that person's only exposure to the scriptures for the entire week. And because they put so much trust and so much faith and the man standing in the pulpit, that they do not even go home. They've certainly stopped taking their Bibles to church. Churches have stopped putting Bibles in the pews. And so they don't go home and test the message against the Word of God. They don't look for themselves. We are a trusting people, and I want you to think about how trusting we are. We go to a restaurant where we don't know the people that work there. We take the menu they give us, we look, we pick out something that looks good, and we trust that behind the gate, behind the wall, behind the counter, that they are doing everything possible to provide me with a healthy, well-prepared, safely prepared, served meal. And I trust that completely. I trust it completely. We trust completely that man in the pulpit. But today, I will tell you, pastor, preacher, has for many become a vocation and not a calling. And when you find pastors who are teaching from books written by man because they're good organization, they'll give you good organization skills or they'll give you good leadership skills. And they try to connect that book to the Bible because that's what the author did. Are they really preaching the gospel as God intended? And listen, I'm not here to judge and critique every message and every denomination, but when we call this program <clears throat> many years ago, when we launched the Igniting a Nation Broadcast Center, revealing the truth, we were going to take the position of calling out. And I'm in good company for those that are controversial, that are calling things out and come and take heed from it. Uh, certainly not to the extent in any way, shape or form would I even compare myself to uh, my Jedi master, Dr. Michael Brown, who uh, I have uh, sat on his teaching and have almost every one of his books. And he spent a week with a group of us and I'm talking 12, 14 hours a day for a solid week te teaching us how to respond to Jewish objections to Jesus. And here he has the line of fire ministries and the line of fire radio. And he takes on what the world is doing and he calls it sin. And it's unapologetic and we are unapologetic. But my concern is not for what they're doing, it's for what the consequence is. And the consequence is, is that the average Christian walking down the street is ill-equipped to share the gospel, to fulfill the great commission, so much to the extent that they would not have a conversation with a Muslim or with a Jew, 
because they wouldn't know what to say. And if the purpose of our preaching is for the equipping of the saints to fulfill their calling as ambassadors for God and as ministers of reconciliation, then are we sending them out fully equipped to do the work of the Lord in the marketplace, in their homes? Or are we in a popularity contest as to how many services we can have in a day and how large a building we have and how big a following and how many books we sell? Yes, man is involved. And where man is involved, there is pride. Yes, we want this radio program to be heard all over the world. We, we would love for millions of people to be listening because we believe that we are presenting the word of God as it was written in context and putting it in a perspective that makes it relevant to your life and to my life. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back on the other side, we're going to continue in this teaching on the counterfeit. We'll be right back. We'll be right back with more Revealing the Truth with Rabbi Eric Walker right after this commercial break. People do some pretty cool things in their 40s and 50s. Why should saving for retirement be any different? I mean, they go back to college. Learn new instruments. Start skateboarding. Whoa. Okay, maybe that one's not for everybody, but saving for retirement is. With aceyourretirement.org, you can get on track with your retirement savings no matter your age. Just have a three-minute chat with Avo, the friendly digital retirement coach from AARP. You'll get personalized recommendations based on your input that are easy to understand and work with your lifestyle. It's quick, easy, and free. Plus, it's sponsored by AARP, so you know they got your back. Woohoo! Gnarly move, Dad. Thanks, sweetie. So, wherever you are in your retirement savings journey, head to aceyourretirement.org and start chatting with Avo today. That's aceyourretirement.org. A message from AARP and the Ad Council. Right now, our country feels divided, but there's a place where people are coming together. I got to tell you, I was nervous to talk to someone so different than me. Me too, but I'm glad we are. Love Has No Labels and One Small Step are helping people with different political views, beliefs, and life experiences come together through conversation. And it feels good. Wow, your story is so... Uh, Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> when people actually sit down, talk, and listen to one another, they can break down boundaries and connect as human beings. At lovehasnolabels.com slash one small step, you can listen to amazing, life-changing conversations and find simple tools to start a conversation of your own. I know one thing. This conversation gives me hope. It gives me a lot of hope, too. Take a step toward bringing our country and your community together by having the courage to start a conversation at lovehasnolabels.com slash one small step. A message from StoryCorps, Love Has No Labels, and the Ad Council. In the Garden of Eden, God spoke his first prophecy. Not much has been said or written about the eternal impact of the enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. What if every prophecy and even Jesus' return was tied to this prophecy and no one ever told you? Now you have a chance to read for yourself Rabbi Eric's latest book, 315, The Genesis of All Prophecy. Featured on Skywatch TV, this book is a must-read. Get your copy at Amazon or from Skywatch TV. And don't forget to order The Codist, Rabbi Eric's prophetic biblical thriller, exposing a diabolical plot to weaponize your DNA. And while you're at it, get his book, The Seven Laws of Abundant Living. Welcome back to Revealing the Truth with Rabbi Eric Walker. Here's your host, Rabbi Eric Walker, ready to take your calls at 850-660-9595. Hello and welcome back in to the second half hour of Revealing the Truth, where we talk about the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker. 
And we are taking your calls at 850-660-9595. We put a little banner at the bottom there, also a link to the website so that you can check out uh, new features on the website and also the Biblical Truth Library. We're in this teaching on the counterfeit. And my concern as to uh, us not becoming lemmings. Now, certainly, if um, we look at the illustration of a lemming, uh, these small animals just walk and follow each other over a cliff. It's one thing just to blindly follow. It's another thing to go check out the cliff and look over the cliff and see what's waiting for you to see whether or not you want to jump over the cliff. And I think what's happening is we have become spiritual lemmings. That we believe by faith, that the pastor is the prophet of God for that congregation. And so we allow denominations to control the messaging. And it's God that is supposed to control the messaging. Now, I can only speak for myself. I remember as I was fully aware that every Friday night I was going to have to give a sermon. Now, I taught prophecy on Tuesday afternoons. I taught Jewish roots and heritage on Tuesday nights. I taught the Torah teaching on Saturday mornings, but the sermon was presented on a Friday night. And as the weekend would end and Monday would come and I would come into my office and I would come in very early. I was usually in the office by 630 in the morning. And that was my prayer time. And I would go into the sanctuary, which was filled with praise and worship music. And I would sit there and I would just soak in it and ask the Lord to show me what it was he wanted me to preach about. And there were literally days that would pass. Sometimes it would be instantaneous. He would tell me right away. But other times I would have to wait. And I have to be honest, at Thursday at 6 o'clock p.m., having no clue as to what the message was going to be, I would get a little uncomfortable. But after the first year, year and a half, I began to trust. And when those quiet times of not hearing from the Lord would take place, I knew that he was the just-in-time God and that I didn't have to worry. And so I would come into the office on Friday and after I would leave the sanctuary and I had not heard in my spirit from the Lord, I had not seen and looking through the pages of scripture as I was there to worship and just read. I would go into my office and I would sit down at my computer and I'd say, okay, I'll pull up some emails and I'll answer some emails. And I would find myself writing. And I would write. And I would write. And I use... Bible software, <clears throat> extensive professional Bible software that, that contains thousands of commentaries and references and resources and maps. And that was my go-to for passages of scripture. And when I was looking for uh, key words and key themes, that's where I would go to search through it. And so uh, God would be taking me to different places and I would look up and the sermon for the day for that evening would be done. And it wasn't something that had to be edited. God had given me what it was he wanted me to deliver. 
And it's really no different in my mind than uh, the doctor appointment that I had uh, the day before yesterday. And in my conversations with the doctor, as he asked me questions, he checked this, he checked that, we talked about this, we talked about that. And he said, okay, I'm going to prescribe this. I believe that the pastor, I believe that my role as a congregational rabbi when I was in that position was to be the physician to study what was ailing the congregation. And that message on Friday night was to deliver the prescription, the antidote. And the confirmation would come when people would say, what, are you reading my mail? Are you listening to my phone calls? Are you in my home? And that was confirmation that, yes, the Holy Spirit was revealing things that needed to be paid attention to within the congregation. This is my view, and this is just my personal view. This is not something that I'm saying that, that uh, everybody has to approach it this way. This is just how I view it as having led a congregation of 750 families. I wanted them to walk away changed. If the worship didn't change them, they hadn't worshiped. If the message hadn't changed them, then I had not done what God, excuse me, God had called me to do. And I would know right away whether or not I'd fulfilled the assignment or not. Now, I have not asked the questions of pastors as to how they feel and how they approach. But I know that that's what I look for. First Peter 5, 8, and 9 says, be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. I want to confirm that with you. Over the years, as I preached, I was in touch with rabbis from all over the world. And we would exchange thoughts and ideas and, and uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, hey, what, what, what's on your heart? What's the spirit telling you to talk about in your service this weekend? And I would say over 70% of the time, three or more of us would be talking about the same theme. As it should be, being led by the Holy Spirit and not by my own desire to convey a message, but my desire to convey his message. So it's the same Holy Spirit working. So when you hear that this pastor and this pastor and this pastor and this pastor all preach a message from 1 John, it's the same spirit. And we should be hearing more of those stories. 1 John 3, 7 to 10 says, Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. He who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin, because God's seed remains in him. He cannot go on sinning because he has been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God, nor is anyone who does not love his brother. What can be gained through deception? The destruction of the Jewish people who by their very voice will usher in the return of Messiah. 2 Corinthians 11, 1 to 5. I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promised you to one husband, to Messiah, so that I might be, so I might present you as a pure virgin to him. 
but I am afraid just as an eye was deceived by the serpent, as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preached, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. Galatians 1.3 Grace and peace to you from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age. When you say this was written 2,000 years ago, yes, it was a word for then and it's a word for now because we are living in that same present evil age. More evil? Evil. There is an advancing darkness. It's palpable, it's tangible, it's perceivable. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Messiah Yeshua gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul goes on to say, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Messiah and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Messiah. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preached to you, let him be eternally condemned. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let him be eternally condemned. Am I now trying to win the approval of men or of God? Or am I trying to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Messiah. I want you to know, brothers, that the gospel I preached is not something that man made up. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Messiah himself. Again, I say to you, if you are going there and you are hearing a gospel different than the gospel preached, speak up. And they may not want to hear what you have to say and leave. But I've been friends with these people for 25 years. This is my whole social world. Well, then that's your church club. That's not the house of the Lord. That's no different than the, the Masonic Lodge, or the VFW, or uh, the Knights of Columbus, or any other meeting place for fellowship. And it's hard for us to hold teachers and pastors accountable when we ourselves don't know the Word of God. I knew the word of God in part from my Hebrew school training and from my time in the synagogue. But when I worked in the corporate world for 35 years, the gospel was not a part. It wasn't until I came to faith. And then was called out of the corporate world. called who in their right mind would leave at the pinnacle of their career I was at the top of my earnings the year that I left with the corporate world I had the largest w2 in the history of my life and I left to go to a city 
that I had never been to in a place that I did not know a single person and did not take a salary for two years to answer the call of God. I'm not a crazy person. And so it had to be the call of God, unmistakable call of God, confirmation from God to do this, or I would have to be crazy. But in that training and in that study, I had to commit myself to preach the word of God. And I have been accused of using a lot of scripture in my messages. I'm accused by using a lot of scripture. If you're looking for a Christian talk show that's entertaining, we may not be that program for you. There's enough entertainment out there. There's so many streaming channels today and so many choices today for entertainment that you could never leave your home and see more movies and more programs than you could ever want. Second Thessalonians 2 and 6. And now you know what is holding him back so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who knows, the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroyed by the splendor of his coming. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders, and in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. But we ought always to thank God for you, brothers, loved by the Lord, because from the beginning God chose you to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. He called you to this through our gospel, that you might share in the glory of our Lord Messiah Yeshua. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the teachings we pass on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. He's talking about the word of God. He's talking about the Bible. He's not talking about the sermon. He's talking about the Bible. We are called by God to receive God's approval, to study, study the word, not just read the word. Yes, I strongly encourage you, do your reading the Bible in a year. But if you're not studying while you're reading it, what good does that do? It's just another check mark in a box. 1 John 2.27 As for you, the anointing you receive from him remains in you. And you do not need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it has taught you, remain in him. And finally, in Matthew 10, 28 and 29, do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body and hell. There's a counterfeit out there. And he's not masquerading and running around in a red suit with a tail and horns. He 
he's the one who's tickling your ear and being used by Satan. And not that these are wicked people, not that these are people who have a purpose that is not under heaven, but they too have been led astray. And they began following the teachings of a man or of a particular denomination. And each one of these 28,000 denominations has different rules. And many of them tell you to disregard the Old Testament. That's not what the word says. It says you are no longer under the yoke of the law. In Jeremiah 31, God says, Behold, I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, and it will not be like the old covenant written on tablets of stone, but I'll write my laws in their hearts, in their minds, and it will be in their hearts. And no longer will they have to teach their brother to know the Lord because they will know them. They will all know the Lord from the greatest to the least. He didn't say I was going, he was going to write a new law. And Jesus didn't come to abolish the law of the prophets. He came to fulfill them. To do away with the Old Testament strips away the gospel of Matthew. To do away with the Old Testament strips away the 500 Old Testament references contained in the book of Revelation. To divorce ourselves from the teachings of the Old Testament is to divorce ourselves from God. God's wisdom is all throughout the Old Testament. Do you have to fast? Do you have to avoid certain foods? Absolutely not. It's made very clear in Acts 15, the only four requirements under the law that apply to the Gentiles. Abstain from the blood. Don't eat meat, strangled meat. Don't eat meat. Sacrifice to an idol and abstain from sexual immorality. That was it. So that means that understanding what Jesus was talking about and who he was talking to were those people who were under that law. And how can you relate to Jesus and to his message if you don't know what he was talking about? And there's a counterfeiter that wants to say, well, do away with all of that. Do away with all that, because that's what would lead you to Jesus if you really read it and understood it. We've come to the time again where we need to go to a short break. And I'll ask you to indulge us again as we take this short break. And we'll be back to you in three minutes and 31 seconds. We'll be right back. We pray today's show blessed you as much as it did us. And hope you will join us weekdays from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. Replays of the show are available online at www.live365.com. Please email your questions and comments to Rabbi Eric at ignitinganation.com or on our social media platforms. Stay tuned for the second hour of Revealing the Truth with Rabbi Eric Walker. The phone lines are open at 850-660-9595. To some people, the sound of a baby babbling doesn't mean much. But that's not necessarily true. By six months, they're combining vowels and consonants. By nine months, they're trying out different kinds of sounds. And by 12 months, their babbling is beginning to take on some meaning especially if there's no babbling at all. Little to no babbling by 12 months or later is just one of the possible signs of autism in children. Early screening and intervention can make a lifetime of difference. 
and unlock a world of possibilities. Take the first step at AutismSpeaks.org. A public service announcement brought to you by Autism Speaks and the Ad Council. The following is made possible by Dad. Why was the basketball court all wet? Because the players kept dribbling all over it. <laughs> the dad joke. Corny, groan-worthy, but also one of the simplest ways to share a moment with your kids. Why do you have to be careful when it's raining cats and dogs? Because you might step in a poodle. <laughs> and kids that spend more time with their dads grow up to be smarter, more successful. Can I tell you a cat joke? Just kidding. <laughs> and with any luck, funnier adults. Why didn't the skeleton go to the dance? Because he didn't have any body to go with. Dad jokes rule. So take a moment to make a moment and give your kid a laugh. <laughs> it's as easy as going to fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. <laughs> That's really funny. The program you are listening to is brought to you by Igniting a Nation, a 501c3 nonprofit ministry. We are 100% supported by your contributions. You can partner with us and support this program, our outreach in Kisi, Kenya, and our support of Israel. Visit us at www.ianbn.com and take advantage of access to thousands of hours of teaching. You can also donate there on our social media platforms. Your support is a blessing here, there, and everywhere. Welcome back to Revealing the Truth with Rabbi Eric Walker. Here's your host, Rabbi Eric Walker, ready to take your calls at 850-660-9595. Hello, and welcome back to the second hour of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker, and our phone lines are open. This is a talk show, uh, call-in talk show, and we welcome your comments and questions. Phone lines are open at 850-660-9595, and we're talking about the counterfeit. And we spent the first hour talking about Satan and the counterfeiter and what is going on around us in this season of what I consider to be uh, the great falling away, a season where apostasy is on the rise, where uh, we are seeing people who are caught up in denominationalism and the body is not operating in unity. And so it's one thing to point out that there is a counterfeit out there. It's one thing to tell you how a little boy learned to discern what Jade felt like by holding on and feeling the authentic until the unauthentic, the counterfeit was placed in his hands, or how the FBI and Treasury and banks trained their tellers to study the authentic. But there's something much larger at work. And I know in many conversations that I've had that so many churches are no longer talking about the gifts of the Spirit. Now, I'm only a reflection of those I talk to. And in churches that I've ministered in and what I've studied and learned, I have resources on my shelf that study and compare denominations so that I can understand and make some sense of it as to what some of the inherent differences are between the denominations. But what I find consistently is that the theology that the denomination subscribes to is a mandate 
that you subscribe to that theology. Uh, and those theologies different, they differ. Uh, they differ from things like um, praying in tongues, tongues or no tongues, miracles or no miracles, the laying on of hands, the non-laying on of hands. Uh, denominations that say you cannot lift your hands. And I think to myself, I can't lift my hands. Well, how can I go up the mountain of the Lord? Because scripture tells me and answers the question, who can go up the mountain of the Lord? It's the one with clean hands. So if I don't present my hands to the Lord to inspect them, to see that they have been set to the work of God and not to the work of sin and man, then how do I ascend to the mountain of the Lord? Just because you say, come on in? No, God says the one who can come up the mountain of the Lord is the one with clean hands. So in worship, I will raise my hands. Surrender? This is not a sign of surrender. Surrender was 25 years ago when I gave my heart and my life to Messiah. That's when I surrendered this life for that life. So me raising my hands is not this Pentecostal charismatic display of mania. I'm simply presenting my hands to the Lord to say, inspect me, search me, O God. In the pattern of King David, search me, O Lord, and see if there's any unclean thing within me. Examine my hands, and if they are clean, let me come up to the mountain of the Lord. I want to enter into his presence. See, to me, the word is clear. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, enter his courts with praise, and then enter his holy of holies. Bow down and worship. I want to enter into the presence of God. And that is a spiritual dimension. That's quantum faith. That's understanding the layers and levels in the spiritual realm that all of us have act, act, uh, access to, but we're taught not to be so spiritual. But it's in the Bible. So if it's in the Bible, why are you teaching me that I can't or I shouldn't? Well, that's not acceptable. Why would I conform to a practice or rule or regulation that does not have scripture behind it? Am I not free to worship as the spirit leads me to worship? that I should raise my hands in the sanctuary and some usher would come and put his hand on my shoulder and say, yeah, please don't, don't do that. This I don't understand coming from a biblical world view. So we've talked about the counterfeit. So we, we can't take the sermon that the pastor wrote and put it in our hands and, and, and all, all the authentic ones, and then he puts one in our hands and recognizes that it's not an authentic one. So God gave us, at this wonderful day of your salvation, it was like the welcome wagon showed up and laid before you on the day that you said, 
that you believed in your heart and professed with your mouth that Jesus was Lord and you're opening your heart to receive all that God had for you. Let me tell you, your prize package was more than you could even possibly conceive of. I am just now 25 years of studying this, beginning to comprehend just a small piece of it. The keys to the kingdom, the keys, the custodial ring of keys to the kingdom have been given unto me and you. The Holy Spirit was given unto me and you. Gifts of the Spirit were given to you. As Paul is listing the various manifestations and gifts of the Spirit for us in 1 Corinthians 12, 10, he tells us to another discerning of spirits. There is a spirit world that is just as real as the material world in which we live. Now, you probably have not been taught about the spiritual realm, the unseen realm, or the hierarchy of heaven, or the gods, plural. One capital G, many little g's. And if what I'm saying to you is foreign, then I encourage you to get a book called The Unseen Realm by Dr. Michael Heiser. And to follow him at drmsh.com. Initials for Dr. Michael S. Heiser, drmsh.com. A brilliant scholar devoted to uh, mastery of ancient languages, lost languages, dead languages, as well as Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, in which he has his doctorate, and understands and explains the spiritual world that is just as war, as real as the material one. The Bible teaches that there are two worlds coexisting, passing through each other. For the most part, we are not conscious of that other world. However, the scripture tells us that the other world, the spirit world, is very conscious of us. The spirit dimension is made up of a different structure. Probably the resurrected body of Jesus was of a different molecular structure. When the disciples were gathered in a room with the doors shut and locked, suddenly Jesus appeared in the room with them. So that this world of spirits is a very real world. And it has a tremendous influence on all our lives. And the influence can either be for good or for evil. I want you to think about that encounter that uh, Jesus had with the demon-possessed man. And he said to him, what is your name? And the man said, we, we are legion, for we are many. So one man possessed by many demons. I can't see the air, I can't see love, I can't see the wind, I can't see the demon, but that doesn't mean they're not real and they are not believable and they don't exist. The Bible teaches us in Matthew 4, 10, and 11 concerning angels that he will give his angels charge over thee to keep thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. He'll give his angels charge over us, meaning I have an angel watching over me.
Now, I have a friend who has had three unique encounters where he has seen manifestation of an angel. I don't question that one bit. Gabriel was seen, Michael was seen. But one thing they all have in common is all angels are male. And when they appear on earth, they appear as young men. Concerning the angels, Hebrew 1 and 14 declares, are they not all ministering angels, ministering spirits, sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? So the angels that Jesus himself has assigned to us are all ministering spirits. Set forth the minister for us. Now we can call upon God to send warring angels and to send Michael and his warring angels, but on a day-to-day -day basis, these are ministering spirits to us, to minister for us, to guard our salvation, to guard our minds, spirits, and bodies. I remember when I had the two stents put in my heart, and I laid on that table. And as I was praying, I was realizing that I had no idea what God had spared me from. And that has become kind of a, a mantra, if you will, a thought I have every day that I have no idea from one day to the next. All the calamities that God has spared me from through his ministering angels. And he goes on to say, and we are aware of the Holy Spirit and his influence upon our life for good. He is convicting us of sin and drawing us to Messiah. This is the beautiful work of that Holy Spirit. The influence of the Holy Spirit is molding and shaping and forming us into the image of Messiah. But there is another realm of spirit beings that are opposed to your walk in Messiah. And these spirit beings can be a very negative influence upon you. As Paul, the apostle, wrote in Ephesians 6 and 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Spiritual wickedness in high places, meaning there are other dimensions and I know that you say, oh, that's that crazy Skywatch TV, you Skywatch TV guys, you defender publishing, publishing authors, you're all into this. Well, because it's real and it's in scripture. And as you go to Israel or you go to the countries in Asia, Africa, and Europe listed in the Bible, and you see the remains, the remnants, the archaeological digs, and you find these temples of darkness and these insignias of a wickedness and the paganry was beyond your wildest imagination of the statues and the Colosseums and the places that were built to these false gods. And how many, like Native Americans, have used natural things like mushrooms and other things that grow out of the earth to transport them into other dimensions and will bring back reports of things they have seen that line up with Scripture. Randy Kay has written a book about his near-death experience, about entering into another dimension. 
Now, he doesn't say he died and he was resurrected. He clearly states it was a near-death experience, but he paints such a clear picture in his word, in his book, and telling his story that you can go to passages of Scripture and see that same description. Now, was it the Scripture that influenced the vision? You have to make that call. And so there is a battle that goes on, a spiritual battle, and we, all of us, experience this spiritual battle. And these forces or spirits of darkness can create a real problem for us as we seek to walk after the Spirit of God. If you are of just a sideline believer, not fully engaged in the work of the Lord, your Christianity is, I go to church on Sunday, I do my part. I give, that's what I do. And that's between you and the Lord. That's not me judging you. That's between me. That's between you and the Lord. You will not have the same spiritual attacks as those who are on the front line. And you may be completely unaware because these things aren't happening to you. But I would question because I find it encouraging in the season of attack that I must be coming close to having some kind of impact or breakthrough or I would not have garnered the attention of the enemy. Why would he want to bother with me if I don't matter? Why would he want to bother with you if you don't matter? in the kingdom. This is why so many leaders are under attack because they matter to the kingdom. They have impact on many people. So to understand this, you almost have to experience it. To experience, you have to get closer to the word, closer to God. Now, the thing about the evil spirits is that they are able to come on as angels of light. And thus, it is possible for a person to be deceived by these evil spirits who, as 2 Corinthians 11 says, Satan is able to transform himself as an angel of light. His ministers are able also to do so and that is why we need to have the gift of discerning of spirits. Now, you may have been taught that the gifts of the spirit don't matter. That was for then, but not for now. And I can say that if you've been told that, you've been told something that is not lined up with the Word of God. Now, I know that you and I have met people who seem to be all right. What they said was fine. You watch them, and they seem to do the right things, but yet you have an uneasy feeling about them. There was just something that you could not define and you could not describe. There was just an uncomfortable feeling around them. And then later on, you discover that it was just all a charade with them. There was no reality of a walk or a relationship with the Lord. And you understand why you had that feeling of discomfort when you were around them. This is the way the gift of discernment of spirits operates. There is just something that's not quite right. It's sort of an intangible thing. You can't really put your finger on it. But I've discovered that one of the difficult things in having the discerning of spirits is that if a per person does not have the discernment of spirits, you cannot understand why they can be so gullible. It's so plain. It's so obvious. You say, 
can you not see? And this is part of the challenge that I have as an outsider. I didn't grow up in Christianity. I didn't grow up in the church. And so as an outsider looking in, and as someone that listens to these messages, and my ears pick up on certain things, and I see people nodding and amening and agreeing, and it's not lined up with Scripture, It frustrates me. And I wasn't called to go around and confront pastors and, and, and to, uh, I was called to, to, to bring light into dark places and to say to you, if this is going on in your life, if this is going on in your church, if this is going on in your family, then maybe you ought to look here. That's it. Almost like somebody directing traffic. I'm not saying that your pastor is a false teacher. I'm not saying that your denomination is a false denomination. I'm not saying that you are subscribing or ascribing to things that will cost you your salvation. What I'm saying is, is we have been warned in Scripture to be on the lookout. And I don't see people looking out. And it concerns me. And my pastoral heart, it concerns me. Because when the day of trouble comes, I know that many are going to faint in fear and not be able to stand firm in the face of the coming trouble. And if you're in America right now, You have been lulled into this belief that we are the greatest country in the world, and we are. I believe that. We have the potential. Right now, I don't believe that we are. I don't believe that any country is great. I'm having a hard time finding great leadership in the world today. But if you have running water, you're better off than... I don't know, 70 or 80 percent of the population of the world. If you have the luxury of air conditioning, electricity, we have around 175 people gathered together twice a week in Kisi, Kenya, in the heat of Africa, and gather together for praise and worship and for a sermon, a message to be delivered and for fellowship, and they have no electricity. We cannot afford to bring power to the building. We just don't have the funds. And so that's one of the reasons why we're looking to help them acquire these two acres to put banana plants on to sell the bananas so that we can afford to bring power and expand the worship center because it is bringing people to faith and it's serving the needs of the community. And yes, there are many, 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 many ministries you can support. And we are but a small speck on the scale of ministries. But the work we do is good work. The people we support are good people. They need our help. We're going through an inflationary period here in this country, 8.2%, and uh, people are going without. For the first time in their lives, they're having to make the decision of choices of what they can afford, what they can't afford. And there's many in the world who look upon this and say, you have choices? We're in the fields digging for grubs and tubers so we can grind them up into a mash to put enough carbohydrates in our body to sustain us, to convert it to sugar, to give us enough energy and strength 
to survive the day in whatever grubs we can find becomes our source of protein. Can we not see that there is need in the world? But yet our own problems are so big that we can't see clearly. And we certainly aren't spending enough time in the word to understand that God wants us to put as a priority the widows and the orphans and the hungry and the needy and those less fortunate than ourselves. The gift of the discerning of spirits apparently was an operation in the church in Ephesus. For as Jesus addresses the church in Ephesus in Revelation 2, he commends them because they had tried those who claimed to be apostles and were not, and they found them to be liars. And after this next break, we're going to get to one of the most classic uses of the gift of the discerning of the spirits found in Acts chapter 8. We're going to take this short break, and we will be right back. We'll be right back with more Revealing the Truth with Rabbi Eric Walker right after this commercial break. Hi, I'm Danica Patrick and proud aunt. Watching my nieces grow, play, and learn is amazing, but not every child gets to be carefree. One in six kids in the U.S. are hungry. One in six. That little girl sitting alone at the playground, she can't play like the other kids. She doesn't have the energy because she's hungry. School lunch will be her only meal today. It breaks my heart that this is the reality in our country, but it's something that Feeding America is working to change. Each year, the Feeding America network of food banks rescues billions of pounds of good food that would have gone to waste. This food is then provided to families and children in need. Being a kid should be about using your imagination, learning, and having fun. These children shouldn't have to miss out on simply being a kid because they're hungry. To find out how you can help end childhood hunger in your community, visit feedingamerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. Okay, men, this is your time. Maybe you didn't choose this, but you're here now. You're going to go out there and be an all-star caregiver. It's up to you. So what are you going to do? You're going to go grocery shopping, cook, clean, be there emotionally and physically. You got to dig deeper. Drive them to physical therapy, doctor's appointments. Don't you forget about the pharmacy. No, you won't. Because that's what caregivers do. Don't give up. Don't ever give up. This is your time to show the world, your family, and yourself that you're tougher than tough. Now go out there and be the best caregiver this world has ever seen. Caregiving is tougher than tough. Find the care guides you need at aarp.org slash caregiving. A public service announcement brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. In the Garden of Eden, God spoke his first prophecy. Not much has been said or written about the eternal impact of the enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. What if every prophecy and even Jesus' return was tied to this prophecy and no one ever told you? Now you have a chance to read for yourself Rabbi Eric's latest book, 315, The Genesis of All Prophecy. Featured on Skywatch TV, this book is a must-read. Get your copy at Amazon or from Skywatch TV. And don't forget to order The Codist, Rabbi Eric's prophetic biblical thriller, exposing a diabolical plot to weaponize your DNA. And while you're at it, get his book, The Seven Laws of Abundant Living. Welcome back to Revealing the Truth with Rabbi Eric Walker. Here's your host, Rabbi Eric Walker, ready to take your calls at 850-660-9595. Hello and welcome back to this final half hour of our edition of Revealing the Truth, where we talk about the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker. Our phone lines are open, and we encourage you to give us a call at 850 660 
609-260-9595. Love to hear from you. Just a shout out to say hello, just to say I love you, I hate you, uh, wish you were off the air, or blessings to you and your family, Shabbat Shalom, whatever it is you want to share. I'm happy to hear your voice. I miss so many of you that I saw on a regular weekly basis many times a week. And so I miss the hearing of many of those voices and would love to hear some new voices as well. We're in this teaching on the counterfeit and the discerning of spirits so that we can be equipped to identify the counterfeit. I think one of the most classic uses of the gift of discerning of spirits is probably found in Acts chapter 8. When Philip had gone to Samaria and preached Messiah unto them, and there was a genuine revival, many believed and were baptized when they saw the miracles that Philip did. Among those who believed and were baptized was a man by the name of Simon, who before Philip's coming was a sorcerer, and he was held in great awe by the people. They thought that he had the power of God in his life. But when Simon saw the miracles, he wondered at the miracles that Philip was able to do, and he believed, and he was baptized. Then we read that when the church in Jerusalem had heard that the Samaritans had also received the gospel, they sent unto them Peter and John. For as yet the Holy Spirit had not come upon them. They had not had this release, the outflow, the overpouring, or what many term the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So that Peter and John came and laid their hands upon the Samaritan believers, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, when this Simon saw that through the laying on of hands by Peter and John, that the Holy Spirit was imparted to these Samaritan believers, he desired to have this power. From the context, he evidently offered money to Peter and John. He sought to buy this power. In the realm of the magicians, there is the selling of the tricks. How did you do that? And with many of their magical tricks, the secrets of how they do it were for sale. The magicians would buy tricks from one another. This had been going on as long as people have been tricking each other. That is the buying of the inside information. And evidently, this thing with Simon was something like that. He had been into sorcery. He had been used to fooling people or deceiving people and working seemingly magic tricks. And now here's something that he cannot quite figure out. All Peter and John are doing is laying hands on these people and the receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. Simon said, I would like to do that. How do you do it? What would you charge me for that one? So Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because that thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Acts 8 and 20. There's several things for us to discern from this. The gift of the Holy Spirit is available for the asking. Now, I've asked many people, whose prayer was answered in Acts chapter 2? And they say, what do you mean? I said, well, the Spirit was now freely available Jesus departed. He said, I will send one 10 days after he departed was the day of Pentecost. That was 50 days from the resurrection. It was also 50 days from the Exodus. It was the same day as the giving of the law was the giving of the spirit. And at the time of the giving of the law, 3000 died at the time of the giving of the spirit, 3000 were saved. So it was on the same day. It was called Shavuot, or the Feast of Weeks, prescribed in Leviticus 23. It was to take seven Sabbaths, and the next day after the seventh Sabbath was the 50th day. That was 50 days from the Exodus, 50 days from the resurrection. 
it was a Sunday. So whose prayer was answered? That the spirit would now be available to anyone for the asking. And I've had many people answer and say it was Jesus, it was John, it was Peter. And they're shocked when I give them the answer. And I tell them it was Moses. And they say it was Moses? I say, yes. It was Moses. Numbers chapter 11. We read about what happened. And Moses had been putting up in the second year of the Israelites' journey. The people began to crave meat and grumbled to Moses, saying they wished they were back in Egypt. The last time the Israelites had complained about the lack of food, God promised a miraculous source of manna. The bread from heaven was sweet. But the people were tired of manna. And Moses was just, as the Southern expression says, he was just give out. He had had enough. And he stood before the Lord and he said, Lord, this is too much for one man. If it's just going to be me, take me now. Just take my life. And so God instructed Moses to gather together 70 of his elders, and he would take of his spirit, which was on Moses, and share it with them. And so Moses called together the 70. And two were not present. And Eldad and Medad stayed behind the camp. And Joshua came running out to Moses and said, Moses, Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp and healing people. And Moses' response was, is what? Are you jealous for my sake? I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on us all of them. It was Moses' prayer that the Lord would make us all prophets and that the Spirit would be available to all of us. Peter was reading the spirit of the man. Although he had joined company with the people who were being saved, followed into baptism, and was there with Philip, Yet his heart was not right in the sight of God. And so Peter said, repent, therefore, of thy, wick of thy wickedness and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. Acts 8 and 22. So here Peter was exercising the gift of discernment of spirits. And he saw that the spirit that Simon had was wrong. His heart was wrong. And he encourages him to repent. And he said, for I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. God wants us to have this gift of a spirit of discernment. Not just discerning the spirits, but discerning the impact the spirits are having in someone's life and thereby being able to tell. We've all been around those people that make us kind of, um, I don't know, they give you the heebie-jeebies. You just tell there's something off. You don't know what it is. You kind of shy away from it. I've listened to pastors who preach that there was just something about it. I know that many of us have seen the televangelists that kind of creep us out a little bit. 
and our spirit tells us there's something amiss. And we're beginning to find out that something was amiss. And we now have people that we held in high regard and, and sent millions upon millions of dollars in contributions. And they did great work, but there was just something. And they're now coming out and confessing that they were wrong. And that God had revealed to them that their message was wrong. There was something you discerned, but you didn't know what it was. You questioned whether or not what you're seeing on TV is real or fake. Is it staged? Are they wheeling those people up in wheelchairs? Are they really infirmed? And you question it. And what that does is that causes people to have doubt about our faith and about the authenticity of our belief in Messiah and in the scriptures. Yes, I believe in the laying on of hands. Yes, I have seen people paralyzed, get out of a wheelchair. Yes, I felt a man's broken bone in his neck move. And it freaked me out. And it freaked him out. And I didn't say anything about it. And he said to me, did you feel that? And I said, I did. But it freaked me out so much, I didn't want to say anything about it. He said, it freaked me out too. He said, but I'm going to stand up now. And I'm going to walk. And he put his hands on the side of the wheelchair. And he got up for the first time. And he walked. And he took his wheelchair and he pushed it to his wife and he said, here, find a home for this. Give it to someone who needs it. I don't need it anymore. I'm healed. Now that had nothing to do with me. I was just a vessel. And he requested the prayer and asked me to lay hands on his neck, on that broken bone that was causing him to be paralyzed from the waist down. And he was healed. I believe in that because the Bible tells me that I have that power and I have that authority when God calls it. That's God's will being done, not my will being done. It's quite possible that down in his heart, he was jealous that the attention that he once had, the power that he once had over these people was being diverted to Peter and to Messiah who Philip was preaching. And thus he thought that if he could buy his power, he could again get the people under his control. But in his heart, there was bitterness. There was this gall of bitterness, and there was this bond of iniquity. Now, I don't care what you have been preached from the pulpit. I only care about what the Word of God says. And if you've been denied the ability to receive the Holy Spirit, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and even if you love that church, go find a church that embraces that and go get filled with the Spirit and go back to your church. But do not deprive yourself of this incredible gift and power and anointing and authority and the ability to perceive and understand what God is trying to teach us in his word. I'm not opposed to denominational Christianity. I'm opposed to the impact that it's having or the lack of impact it's having. When the researchers tell us that the divorce rates among Christians and non-Christians are the same, and the murder rates, and the abortion rates, and, and the uh, all the data confirms that we are no longer a people set apart.
And it's not that we're supposed to be better than other people. We are supposed to be different than other people. Now, throughout the scriptures, we are told that we are to try the spirits to see if they be of God. And there are many prophets who have gone out into the world who are not of God. And therefore, it's important that we have the discernment of spirits so that we're able to try the spirits. As in the church at Ephesus, when someone comes along and claims to be an apostle, we have that capacity of spiritual discernment and we can find them to be liars. Throughout the scriptures, there are warnings concerning the false prophets, those who would come in the name of God and supposedly speak the word of God, but God said so many times that he did not send them. He did not speak through them, and he denied the words that they were saying as coming from him. This is sort of a dilemma today because there are many false prophets who are gaining a great amount of notoriety. I feel a certain responsibility of warning the flock of God concerning some of these false prophets. The problem is the minute I begin to give names and incidents and proof that a person is a false prophet, then there's always those weaker souls who are offended and say, oh, how can you say that about brother so-and-so? I was so blessed by his ministry. I was healed when I reached out and touched the television set. I've been supporting him. So many times it's difficult to warn people of things that you know or understand. Sometimes you know by the spirit and just sometimes by observation. And sometimes you know by information that's coming to you. And so I don't name names. I encourage you to discern for yourself. To discern whether or not what I'm telling you is true and lines up with the word of God. Jesus warned in Matthew's gospel in Matthew 24, 24, for there shall arise false messiahs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders in so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. This is why it's extremely important to have the gift of a discernment of spirits. You cannot always tell a false prophet by what he says. Many times what he says is 99% correct, and that's what makes them so dangerous. You cannot always tell them by their actions. When I first came to Birmingham in 2005, and started to be introduced around to the community as the new rabbi that was starting a new congregation, I was invited to a gathering. And this was at a point in time when uh, I'd sold the big house and uh, moved into a much smaller home, uh, had rented uh, a one bedroom apartment and still maintained a home in Atlanta and was beginning the process of commuting uh, from Atlanta to Birmingham three, four, five days a week. And finally, ultimately made the permanent move. But during that time, as I was being introduced around, I was invited to a meeting where a woman who was uh, a well-respected prophet in these circles said Please invite the rabbi. I have a word from the Lord specifically for him. And so a very wonderful woman reached out to me and said, um, I received a call from this prophetess and she asked me to specifically invite you to this gathering. And she has a word from the Lord for you. And I said, of course, I'll, I'll, I'll come. I'd love to meet the people. It's an opportunity to meet more people. And so the time came where conversations had died down and she gave a little presentation. Then she said, I, I want to call the rabbi up here because one of the reasons I'm here is because God sent me to deliver a message to the rabbi. Now, I want to restate that this is at the time where I had just left corporate America. I had just sold my seven bedroom home and moved into a much smaller home and rented a one bedroom apartment. 
and was beginning the work of planting a brand new congregation in a city that I had never been in, where I was just now meeting people for the very first time. And she calls me forward in a very loud voice, says, Rabbi, the Lord would say to you, I have seen how hard you have labored and how long you have struggled. And you are about to enter a season of rest and restoration and vacations are going to be given to you. Financing is going to be given to you for you to travel for leisure and pleasure. And I was like, what? And I just shook my head and I walked out the door. Here I was embarking upon all the work that it takes to build a congregation. And there are not a lot of you out there who have ever started to work from scratch. Of the hundred or so rabbis that I was affiliated with, only two of them had ever started a work from scratch. I couldn't get advice because nobody had done it in so long. The last one was in the 80s. And so I couldn't get counsel. I had to create whatever was created using the skills that I received from corporate America in marketing. This was clearly a false prophet. Peter warned, but there were false prophets also among the people, as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words, make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not, from Second Peter 2, 1 and 3. But here's the key. Through their feigned words, they will make merchandise of you, that is, take advantage of you financially. Through feigned words or false words, through flattery, whatever their whole, word, whole motive is, just to make merchandise of you. Paul writes to Timothy and says, if any man teaches otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmising, perverse disputings of men, of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing the gain in God is godliness from such withdraw thyself. Those who would teach you that godliness is a path to riches or false prophets, Paul warns us against us. And so there's a lot more to this, but I have run out of time. But I want us to be aware this gift of discernment of spirits is an important gift. And as I said, I'm certain that many times it has operated in your life without you being thoroughly cognizant of the fact. There is just that queasy, uneasy feeling that you often get when someone comes along and they seem to say the right things and do the right things, but there's something that just seems just, well, you can't put your finger on it. It's an intangible thing, but you are just uncomfortable. When I get that kind of check in my spirit, I always walk away very carefully. The Lord wants us to be wise, but there are limitations to our wisdom, and that is where the spirit comes in. And he is able and he is faithful. And I have been taken more than once, but every time I have been taken, there was a check or there was a warning, and I sort of just said, no, they're fine, and I can tell by the look in his eyes how important it is that we learn to follow the leading of the Spirit that saves us from a lot of trouble. Father, we thank you for the help that the Holy Spirit gives us. 
how he helps our infirmities, which are so many. Not only do we not always know how to pray as we ought, but Lord, many times we don't know who we can trust or not trust. But we do, we, we do not know if the man is a deceiver or real. And so, Lord, we pray that you would grant to us that discernment of spirit. Lord, you know the hearts and you know the thoughts and the intents of a person's heart. And Lord, we want to be kind. We want to be generous. We want to be giving and compassionate to those who are truly in need. But Lord, we do not want to be taken. And so help us, Lord. Give us keen, sharp discernment. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now I leave you with these words from Numbers chapter 6 and verse 22. When the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the children of Israel. He goes on to say in this way, I will put my name on you, on them, and bless them. Please bow your heads to receive the ironic benediction. Yivarecha Kadonai v'yesmerecha. Ya'er Adonai panavaleka v'kunecha. Yisar Adonai panavaleka v'yesimlecha shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance toward you and give you his peace. In the name of the Prince of Peace, Jesus, our Messiah. Amen and amen. Shalom. The program you are listening to is brought to you by Igniting a Nation, a 501c3 nonprofit ministry. We are 100% supported by your contributions. You can partner with us and support this program, our outreach in Kisi, Kenya, and our support of Israel. Visit us at www.ianbn.com and take advantage of access to thousands of hours of teaching. You can also donate there on our social media platforms. Your support is a blessing here, there, and everywhere. This is the story of a very special woman. In a matter of seconds, she turned herself into a great mathematician or an entrepreneur. Her knowledge was limitless and still is. She could also make monsters disappear, especially those that lurked in the shadows under the bed. Once, this woman put back together a teenage girl's broken heart, which had been shattered in a thousand pieces just by giving her a bear hug. She masqueraded as a regular person at work but as a superhero at home. Everyone knows her as Gabriella. I still call her mom. Your hero needs you now, and AARP is here to help. Find the care guides you need to help, complete with tips and resources at aarp.org caregiving. A public service announcement brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. Adopt U.S. Kids presents What to Expect When You're Expecting. A teenager, learning the lingo. Today I'm going to help parents translate teen slang. Now, when a teen says something is on fleek, it's exactly like saying, that's rad. It simply means that something is awesome or cool. Another one is totes. It's exactly like saying, totally, just shorter. As in, I totes love going to the mall with Becca. Another word you might hear is jelly. Jelly is a shorter, better way to say jealous. As in, Chloe, I am like so jelly of your unicorn phone case. You don't have to speak teen to be a perfect parent. Thousands of teens in foster care will think you're, um, rad just the same. To learn more, visit AdoptUSKids.org. A public service announcement brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Adopt US Kids, and the Ad Council. Thank you for listening to Revealing the Truth with Rabbi Eric Walker. Join us tomorrow at 8 a.m. Central Time and give us a call at 850-660-9595. Full downloadable versions of all the teachings are available at ignitinganation.com. Don't forget to listen 24-7 for Revealing Life, Revealing the Bible, Revealing Prophecy, Revealing the Gospels, and more of Revealing the Truth. Download Igniting a Nation or listen on iHeartRadio. Until we see you right back here tomorrow, Shalom. Shalom and Shabbat Shalom, my friends. We will see you Monday at 8 o'clock a.m. for the next edition of the live show, Revealing the Truth. 
Until then, stay tuned 24 7 on our apps, on, on uh, iHeartRadio, as well as on the UnitedNation.com website. Until we see you again next week, Shabbat.